such a joy to be together and to learn together. We have a power packed program and just incredible leaders who are going to share their inspirational journeys and experiences and information. Please feel free throughout the session to pop your questions onto the chat function and always uh, keep your microphones off unless you are speaking. And hopefully at the very end of each session, there'll be space for you to ask questions or for me to pick up some of the questions that are placed in your chat. And um, we're going to really explore this concept. And just before I introduce our leader for the day, I'm just going to introduce myself. Um, Uzo Iwobi, uh, name is very Nigerian and it means the doorway of blessing. I guess we're all going to have a good blessing today. I'm going to um, uh, say that. Um, first and foremost, um, my experiences since I arrived in Wales just about 30 years ago have been quite a mix. And many of you who I may have worked with or who know me uh, um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a friend level capacity will know that it has been a very very rough and difficult challenging time and this is exemplary uh, and also um uh, you know rather experienced by so many other leaders who have their interesting leadership journeys to share many of us have overcome incredibly difficult challenges and i say for a black woman i've had triple glazed ceilings that I've had to smash through my whole life. So it's about being, leading for all, being connected to the grassroots communities that make me thrive, being connected to my family, being connected to my church family. They've sustained me. And today the early question I want to ask you is, how connected are you to the very, very, very people might say significant people that make your organization work, your cleaners, your the, the people who do your administrative work, the um, people who make place orders around your work, your own leadership team, your frontline officers or officials. How connected are we as leaders? And just before I introduce our, our, our next speaker, I'm going to just give you a little insight into my own leadership journey. Having come from Nigeria um, as a very young and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, newly qualified barrister and solicitor. I was so excited to join my husband here, Andrew, who's the best man in the world, I think. Um, he's a mixed heritage. His mother's, um, his mother's white, um, English, Jewish, and left the shores of England when she was 25, going on 26, to marry a black Nigerian engineer she met in UCL. You can imagine the shock that rippled through the Jewish community when she had to um, get on a ship because there weren't any um, uh, flights in those days to Nigeria. Mother was terrified, but coming into a completely different uh, nation with a different language, a different culture, that's just how I feel. Because for her, coming into Nigeria was such a, a huge challenge. And for me, moving over here, I didn't realize how different it would be. And my first experience was going to look for a job and um, going to the job center in Swansea. And I was told as soon as I presented my um, certificates, my call to bar certificate and my solicitor's qualification um, by this of official in the job center, she says, so what do you want to do? I said, I want to practice law. And, and she looked at me and said, what's your name? I said, Uzo. It's short for Uzo Amaka. And like I said to you this morning, it's a doorway for blessing. She didn't smile. She said, what was the name? I said, Uzo, U-Z-O. Oh, we can't say that name. You better choose an English name if you're going to get on in this society. And let me tell you something else. You will never get a job in the legal profession because you're black. I was... I think I was utterly speechless, but that marked a lot of my journey um, and still does in my life. And I remember my first job in the UK was working in Toys R Us for £2.40 an hour. 
and packing crisps on a night shift at the Smith's factory in Swansea at £3.60 an hour because I was determined to work and not just sit down and get on the door because I could. My husband was a, a, is a law lecturer at the Swansea University and there were very, very few lecturing jobs available. And I genuinely felt I wanted to practice law. And I had this passion about defending people who didn't have a voice. Well, one interview I went in um, a solicitor's firm was met with a huge disappointment. This man interviewed me for one hour and a half on every aspect of law, apart from civil procedure, which was what the advert was. And um, I remember thinking to myself, gosh, we've gone round the country. We've done the legal theory of law, jurisprudence. We've done co a bit of company law. We've done um, criminal law, administrative law, even environmental law. And I was thinking, when are we going to talk about civil procedure? And at the end of this one and a half hour tour, this man looked at me and said, gosh, you're a very intelligent woman. I said, thank you. Does that mean I get the job? And he said, no, I just wanted to know what they teach you in those countries. So there was absolutely no intention. That was the only chance or response I had to 55 applications to get a job in this country all those many years ago. And then I went back to the job center and this woman said, I think, forget Forget your pipe dreams. Stop telling people you're a barrister. Nobody wants to know, really. Get a job on the shop floor and work your way. That's all I can say. So I thought I'm desperate for a job and I stopped. I removed all my applications. I wouldn't apply. 55 applications had done well. Even to Cardiff, Bristol, I was desperately looking for a job. And packing crisps and selling toys, I was determined to be the best that I could be in that situation. And I remembered my father's voice saying to me, Uzo, let there be a before Uzo and an after Uzo. Make your mark so that even if you're a road sweeper, those roads would never look cleaner in their lives because you're not there. Let your presence be powerful and impactful. And I say the same to all the leaders who are gathered here, irrespective of what role you feel, let there be an impact made by the excellence and the efficiency to which you bring to your role. And that's exactly what I did. And within the first year, I won employee of the year. I was absolutely delighted. And many women will know that having in many organizations, they just don't give you a job because they think you're going to be um, on maternity leave forever. So I hate that pregnancy. My friend said to me, don't ever say that you're pregnant. It's ice 10, so you can imagine how slim I looked. And I just used to wear loose tops. And the minute they say anybody to climb this uh, tall uh, ladder to carry massive patterns, I'd volunteer because I really wanted to keep that job. And the risks I put that to prove that I could. They had no idea, my boss had no idea I was expecting until the day before, um, I, the day before my daughter came and um, I left work and she had a call that I'd given birth. She said, what? You're joking. She's not pregnant. Yes, she was. And up to yesterday night and into the morning, 12.04 of the day I worked, my daughter popped out and Nothing prepared me for the feeling of responsibility. And that was my first training on leadership. Do you hold together your family as a man, as a woman? And just the challenges that my children went through in this country, nothing prepared me for the racism that they faced. And, you know, at the age of seven, being born in Singleton Hospital with other people, I assumed that I would have a very, very comfortable experience and my children would as well. Well, they went to school to be abused and bullied on the grounds of their race. At the age of seven, my son was locked in a toilet um, by four white children that he went to toddler school with. 
One held the door and three kicked him to an inch of his life. They said they don't want black penguins. They don't want black people in the school. My two children then were the only two black children in the whole school. I was dealing with a daughter who at the age of four was asking me, mom, why, why is, why, when am I going to be, have pink cheeks? White, like everybody else, because I want pink cheeks. And having to tell my daughter that this is who you are ever going to be and explain to her that people have pink cheeks because they look like their parents, were things I never thought growing up in Nigeria, where everybody looked like me that I'd have to deal with. Or to deal with my husband returning with a, a returning home with a badly beaten up boy, bleeding, both eyes shut and weeping because was black and, and penguin and chuck him out using the advert, pick up a penguin and chuck it out and all that. And having to have hospital treatment for injuries from beating by seven year olds, three of them, and one held the door for 40 minutes, five children were missing in a, in a classroom. I have never had to practice my leadership skills more than dealing and understanding, you know, and supporting my children through what they face. The same thing with my daughter. Three different schools and the racism that they face, that she faced. She's a very gifted musician. You can check her out if you will be, is her name. Follow her on Twitter, it'll make her day. She's a five consecutive five track BBC Radio Wales A list artist. And when she was young, she won many awards on, on music. She's just a gifted pianist. And my mother-in-law, who's Jewish, all her mother was a gifted pianist and her cousins are composers. So you can see how genetics works. The Jewish was music. And the children would always say to her, stop getting A's or we'll throw you off the Ivo Tower on a school trip. Stop getting A's. They'd, uh, you know, all manner of cruelty. You have to sit on the floor in the playground. And having to raise my children to grow their aspirations and never be crushed was the biggest challenge. And for me, my son walk, coming out from that hospital checkup after his beating, and he looked at me and said, I hate white people. There was my greatest challenge. And I immediately thought, we have to address this because this is how black boys get angry and get furious and feel like the other. And so dealing with all this um, was horribly traumatic, as well as trying to grow your career, as well as trying to be effective in your job. And then I had got a law lecturing part-time job and was pay, paid 27 pounds an hour. That was my first um, you know, job in you know, teaching law. And I just remember thinking to myself, how can we get through my house being smashed, called to, to F off back to my country, and my children told to go back home? They're born here. They, they Welsh Nigerian kids, Welsh with Nigerian heritage. And which home again? This is home. Or are we not able to be at home because we're not white? And that is the challenge that many of us continue to face every day. Um, Welsh government have published a race equality action plan and anti-racist Wales. And that was a key part of the work that I was involved in as a specialist policy advisor on equalities to Welsh government. From walking, working in Walker's factory to fighting my way through interview processes, shortlisting processes, I became one of the 13 commissioners to the Commission for Racial Equality. I was appointed by Tony Blair to serve during his cabinet era alongside other incredible um, humans who wanted to work on race equality. I interviewed successfully before that to um, serve in the, at the Home Office on a tripartite partnership which was representing 43 police forces in the UK and responding to the Association of Chief Police Officers. Did I think, did anybody think from Walker's factory 
where I was packing crisps at £3.60, that I'd be walking Masham Street talking to um, Charles Smith on a matter relating to race equality and be taken seriously. I mean, who, who would have thought it? But my grounding were my children, my local grassroots community. I'm a very, very community oriented person. And I never ever, you know, stop creating things. For example, I set up the African Community Center in Wales. We started with four people just to support each other. And on that board, we had white Welsh people who were passionate and positive about black African people and wanted to support and work with us. And that was the first charity I set up. Since then, I've set up Race Council Cymru, um, the Zero Racism Campaign. And if you've never signed up to it, now's your chance to check out Zero Racism Campaign and sign up to end racism in our generation. In my view, how could I have done all those things? Because I remained connected to the people that source me and to my faith and to my calling. And is being connected as a leader in your own roles, in your own organizations, to find those things that you really need to ground you, that enables you to thrive and to fly. So my leadership journey um, continued when I joined Welsh Government as the first Black and the first Black woman to serve um, Welsh Government. Uh, my direct report was Jane Hart, best minister in the world, Jane Hart, uh, the Minister for Social Justice, and together we serve Mark Drakeford, the first minister. It's the greatest honour of my life. I couldn't believe after two loads of interviews when I was called, I think I was crying and calling Jesus. I'm sure they thought they, you know, something had gone off. I was, I don't think they've ever had such a joyous reaction and such a, a warm reaction to being told you've been successful at this interview. And it's been my life's honour, the warmth that they showed me. I walked onto that top corridor, and of course, you can imagine at that time, I was probably the only um, black woman, um, African, on the corridor. And the warmth and the friendship and the opportunity to thrive. Honestly, I was line managed by a fantastic Welsh government leader called Claire Bennett. Tell her I said, she's just incredible. And together, they honed me, embedded me. If you create that environment where people who are different to you in your leadership and journey are able to thrive and grow, they bring the best of themselves. And I say this because at the time that I started working as a specialist policy advisor in 20, was it was May 1st, 2019. And I spent two years and eight months. I finished my time the 31st of December. Non of us and none of the government knew that there would be a pandemic where four to one black, Asian and minority ethnic people would die to their white counterparts because of socioeconomic reasons. And because I was in that role, I was able to quickly support the first minister with getting people together to advise him on his um, advisory committee dealing, looking at specifically how to save lives, but not just all lives, but how to address the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. Would that have been possible if I wasn't feeling welcomed, included, ce uh, uh, celebrated, I want to say, but you know, in Welsh civil service, they're very, very measured. But it was, there was absolutely no doubt that I could be myself within the workplace and still connect with my grassroots communities like the Black History Wales Committee, like the Windrush Camry Elders, that like the National Black Asian and Minority Ethnic Youth Forum for Wales. Many of these community grassroots initiatives just keep me going, keep me grounded. Has racism stopped? No. Intensified. But my resilience to be able to address the problems that I face continues, one, because of my faith, two, because I have seen and been mod supported by incredible mentors, 
coaches, people who have drawn alongside me, both white and black, and I call them white brothers and sisters, and you know, people who have come alongside me and have supported me and held my hand in friendship. Who are those kinds of people in your own lives? Look around you. Who do you have as a mentor and a role model, as a coach, as a support, as a supporting uh, anchor? If you don't, generate those wonderful support mechanisms for yourselves and get connected. Get well and truly connected. Today, we're going to look at this concept of leadership and leading for all, the overall theme of renewing. Post this pandemic, how are you renewing? Recovering regenerating and inspiring your your teams through a path that leads them to an emergent future a powerful and effective a successful transformational future that will deliver change in your organizations i think we can do it i know we can do it because i'm doing it in my life and i said to them trust me the best is yet to come, irrespective of the racism, irrespective of the battles that we have to go through. In my own personal experience, I am determined to continue to hold on to my faith and hold on to the people who energize me. Find people that celebrate you, that actually energize you, that make you feel alive. You deserve to be a happy leader. And a happy leader is an engaged and challenging and powerful leader, irrespective of the job you are doing, whether you're the road sweeper, whether you are the cleaner in that company, whether you are the chief executive or the director of your company, be the best you that you can be to drive people to effective leadership. 